My name is Lauren Oback. I'm your moderator today from the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library, and I want to welcome everybody to today's program. This is number four in our seven session series, America's Civil War with Arthur Gottlieb. This program is co-sponsored by the Monroe Historical Society and the Friends of the Library. The Friends, throughout the duration of December, are going to be doing a half-priced book sale. So if you haven't gotten down here for that yet, you still have a couple weeks to get those gifts. Um, this session is number four. Number five, we're going to close out 2021 on December 29th with the War Fought on Rivers and Seas. This program is being recorded. The, it only records the people that are actively speaking. So if you have a question, the chat is not recorded. I can ask your question for you. So we're just going to ask that you put those questions into the chat box. Arthur will stop periodically and get to those questions. We'll also have plenty of time for the Q&A. If you do not want to be on camera, I can pause the recording. So we can do that too. Just send me a DM that says you want to ask a question, but you don't want to be recorded, and I can edit that for you. Your cameras are set to be on. Your microphones are set to be off. I am enabling AI-assisted closed captioning. It doesn't always get the captions right, so if you find them distracting or annoying, you can turn those off by pressing the green CC button that's located at either the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device. I'm happy to introduce Arthur Gottlieb here today. He's a local historian on subjects of political and military history. He has worked as the director of technical exhibits and as a professional curator of naval history at the Intrepid. He was also in the U.S. Coast Guard for 17 years and currently works as a counselor and certified senior advisor. Welcome. I already tried that. Oh. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all feeling well. And today um, is our uh, fourth session out of seven on the Civil War. And the title of today's program is Blacks and the Civil War. And um, geez, this is another one where I could spend, if we had three hours on this or a six part series on Blacks and the Civil War, then we certainly could do that. As it turns out, we're gonna have approximately in an hour, an hour and a half. And what I wanna start off with as I've been doing is ask a question starting off from the audience. Uh, it was there something that you need me to um, explain from last time? Uh, is there something that you don't understand or that you're hoping I'm gonna talk about? Uh, go ahead and put it in the chat room or raise your hand, all right? So I wanna make sure that there's time for uh, a little bit of interaction here as far as questions are concerned. Anything so far? Okay. So what we have is the overall subject of the Civil War, right? As in contemporary terms, looking back on history, we tend to view history in the way that we see current events of the day, right? And that's true of any uh, era of time um, during different periods of time, even our, in our own lifetime, certainly in our own lifetimes, there have been periods where academics, the media, uh, intellectuals have considered history from a specific point of view, right? And the period of time that we happen to be in right now is one where people are looking heavily on racial issues looking back on our own American history, uh, not even in a revisionist sense, I would say that this is completely uh, past revisionism. If you consider, for instance, the 1619 Project or critical race theory and other things, uh, it is a really different way of looking at some of the fundamental aspects of how we have traditionally understood American history. So let me just say in a general category, um, uh, issues of social justice or redistributive justice um, or repar uh, reparation justice is very heavily on the table these days. And um, 
I, I'm in the process right now of doing my um, finishing my continuing education credits for my licensed clinical social worker in Connecticut and licensed master social worker in New York. And it's mandatory reading for me to keep up my licensure about social justice issues, which are focusing heavily on the things that I have just mentioned. So we're looking at the Civil War through the lens of social justice and, of course, the injustice slash atrocities of chattel slavery or organized slavery into an industry where people aren't really um, human beings, they're property. Right? That's what we're talking about from today's standpoint. And certainly as a modern person, I would say, how could you not look at it from that standpoint? But that's just a trick of history. Uh, people well, 150 years from now will be looking at you and I, and even at our best, wondering how we could have been this way. All right. Now, it's not to excuse anything that happened during 150 years ago during that era. Uh, it's just a historical context. So I've got a few things that today that we're going to be focusing on as far as documents are concerned uh, that occurred during the Civil War that changed the aspects of um, of uh, black people in the United States during this period of time and certainly affected the Civil War primarily. And that is number one, the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which went into effect in the beginning of 1863. And I'm gonna talk about how this has affected blacks during the Civil War, the topic of today's series. Something else also that came up at the end of the Civil War uh, was the 13th Amendment. All right, now the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment are going to be a big part of our understanding of the legacy of the Civil War, which we'll do during our period of uh, reconstruction, which is scheduled for Wednesday, January 26, 2022. Beg your pardon. And, uh, but the 13th Amendment uh, has to do with today's program because it occurred during the Civil War. Uh, and it is all something that uh, affected people's ability to anticipate events turning into a motivator of events, that is emancipation and freedom. Um, some of the other things we're gonna talk about are the fact that in the Northern states, which nominally uh, Blacks weren't subject to the kind of organized um, slavery as they were in the South. Uh, we've talked about this before. I mean, just because the Union uh, of the North was fighting by 1863 onwards, whether they wanted to or not, with the cause of the eradication of slavery, there was no big love for American Negroes. Uh, it was widespread prejudice. Um, we always go for the racial aspect of it, say racism today. And, and, and people, just because we didn't think that Black people should be owned by other people, doesn't mean that I want you taking my job, at least potentially, being educated and competing for me in the workforce, uh, having you marry my daughter, or moving next door, you see. You know, and this form of uh, prejudice was to endure, as you already know, after the Civil War in the form of Jim Crow laws, et cetera, certainly in the South, uh, well into uh, our lifetimes. And um, <clears throat> so the Civil War is a seminal period of time in American history and cast a very long shadow uh, about at the end of the Civil War, what became legal as far as slavery or the absence of slavery and the practice of what slaves were, former slaves were allowed to achieve in this world and access to things, which in its renewed effort today was on the table as far as redistributive justice, et cetera. Um, it is a direct line from what we're talking about right to the moment, right? 
So let's look at it this way. The Southern states, the deep Southern states at war with the North. Now, the deep Southern states have a plantation society, an agricultural society, and maybe somebody didn't own slaves. Maybe somebody owned a dozen slaves. Maybe somebody owned 400 slaves. Maybe another plantation owned a thousand slaves, you see. So we have this deep social hierarchy in the South, as far as the pecking order of who's the boss, who's in charge, and consequently, who's not in charge and who's not the boss, right? So you have the Civil War comes up, and the manpower has to be taken from the able-bodied white soldiers of the South. Now, what does that leave on these plantations, on these farms down in the South? It doesn't leave able-bodied white men. It leaves old men, it leaves children, it leaves women. So the first aspect I wanna talk about as far as Blacks it, during the Civil War is Blacks in the South in the form of slaves on plantations, large or small, and how life changed for Black people in relationship to the white people that were left, right? Because the people who had the power to keep people really in slavery, at least in a physical sense, in a lawful sense, were off at war. And needless to say, so many people got killed of that cohort of able-bodied Southerners who went to war, that now that wife who was waiting for her husband to come home is now co not coming home, right? So you've got children, you've got widows, you've got elderly people, and you have all of these slaves. So who takes on the responsibility for running the property? Who takes on the responsibility for, run, for bringing the crops in? Well, oftentimes it was the actual slaves themselves. You see, so it's, it's a little bit more of a complicated relationship that slaves had with slave owners um, in the South because one of the mythologies um, and this is a heavily sociological subject, of course. Well, the South always wanted to make it seem that their, the white slaveholding population was very benevolent towards uh, the slaves or the oppressed, as I would call it. Now, how is it that this is benevolent? Well, as in a prejudicial sense, and we call this in psychology ration, rationalization, is that people felt, well, you know, Black people can't take care of themselves. So it's part of our noblesse oblige to be able to take these groups of people, this, this entire race of people, Black people, American Negroes, and they need to be taken care of as if they're, I don't know, um, somewhere between people and your favorite pet, you see? So we really love them and that's why we wanna take care of them and they need to be taken care of and they know they need to be taken care of and that's why they love us taking care of them, you see? So, so from a Southern standpoint, People feel a sense of virtue because they're doing the right thing by taking care of this whole class of people. And they're doing so in a very benevolent and loving way. And there was all kinds of examples of this in readings about Leather's home and, and, and various accounts of relationships between slaves and slave owners that they're making the comparison, for instance, a slave owner between how people are treated in the North versus the South. So if you have a black person who's not a slave, who's in, I don't know, Detroit, and they become elderly, they, they still have to work until they fall over or nobody takes care of them because it's a heavily um, industrialized society and in the capitalistic nature of it, nobody's gonna care for you unless you can provide for yourself, you see? So in other words, the black person is really worse off 
being a free person in the North. Whereas in the South, once you get past a certain age, we take care of you, even though you're still a slave and you fathered, you know, 10 kids who were now active working slaves. We're benevolent because we're taking care of you right now. So today in psychology, we would call this a rationalization, that there's no excuse for enslaving anybody, which I'm sure probably everyone here would agree with. You see, but it's under, you have to understand how one side sees it if you're going to understand what the argument is. You see, so another thing in psychology to remember about this, uh, if you choose to think about it this way, or you want to look it up afterwards or on the side, is something called Stockholm syndrome, which you probably already know what means. Uh, it is uh, like you got captured by a bad guy and then you wind up being sympathetic towards the bad guy who now has you as your the prisoner, you see? So there's a lot of that involved, right? So this is a very heavy thing from this kind of angle. Like I said, we could do a six part series just on blacks during the civil war, right? But the thing is that black people whether they be literate or not, were a very strong community. And there was a way of communicating from plantation to plantation to plantation. So it was like this underground network of information. Remember, you don't have to be literate to be a smart person. Uh, they, we've had generations of people, even up into my lifetime, that weren't necessarily literate, that actually were smart people you know my father's father was functionally illiterate in the english language um yet he spoke four different languages fluently right and that's in my own lifetime you see so what are the messages that are going back and forth well the message is everybody knows there's a war on and what is the war about and what does it mean and there was this thing uh, in 1862 to become effective in 1863 called the Emancipation Proclamation. And how does news travel? Well, if we're gonna be emancipated, maybe we should sit tight, you see, because it's not gonna be long. Uh, and that created a, a kind of a strange situation where you have blacks who really yearn to be free or let's make the assumption that they're yearning to be free. And why don't you just start running now? Well, the answer to that is that if you're gonna be free soon, then why take the risk of getting shot, of being captured somewhere else and being brought back for bounty and then having that stigma on you. Uh, and also don't forget that you have a family structure in the uh, slave community. And if you had a wife, if you had children, et cetera, a mother or father, you would stay there with them. You'd rather be there with them and wait for the eventuality of what was going to be hopefully some version of freedom. You see, so black people didn't go running for the hills as soon as the war was on and they had a chance possibly to get away. And if you were gonna get away, where were you going? Where were you going? Now you had the American army who was coming down South and by virtue of the Emancipation Proclamation, the American army became an agent of people's um, protection. Right now, people who were running, if you were a slave and you were technically property and you were running, then you were a word that was called, um, you were contraband, you see. And the army, American army, became responsible for, and the American Navy of taking care of you if you were to fall into the hands of the army or the Navy. You see now, but that means that if the army was coming to you, to your town, to Antietam, to Atlanta, to Sharpsburg, to all of these different places, then maybe you would have that opportunity to go and find the Yankee army 
and then attach yourself to them and make sure that they would protect you. But the vast majority of the South never saw the American army. They were nowhere near the American army or any place the American army was gonna be fighting. So where were you running? There was really no place to go. And in the, between the Northern states and the Southern states, right? The deep Southern states, you had something called the border states. And the border states were like, we're not joining the South, so we're not in a state of insurrection, but we're sympathetic to the Southern cause and slavery is still legal here. You see, so if you were a Southerner, a Southern Black, and you actually made it past into uh, one of these border states, you were considered stolen property and anybody could grab you and bring you back and, and including in the Northern states too. You know, we had still laws on the books that if you made it to, I don't know, anywhere that's officially a Northern state, that you had these bounty hunters who would grab you and drag you back to a Southern state and sell you for a price. You see, so there was a lot of bad people around, right? Not to say that there were more bad people around then than there are now. Unfortunately, it seems that opportunity begets bad behavior. And that is something of a social and a moral nature uh, that is that you could draw a line straight back from your biblical stories right to the present moment. Okay, just because of all of our technology today, we have not exceeded evil. We have not. So Southern people who were still in their plantations, the wife, the old man, the children, the sisters, the aunts, who were in charge of the plantation, who were trying to run a farm, actually wind up being in a different relationship with these people who, before their husband left for the war to fight for the Confederacy, was really just, they were slaves. Now that relationship was changing because the Civil War, just by the very nature of it, and what I'm describing to you in the absence of men, changed the relationship between the slaves and the people who were still left on the plantations. Now, of course, people in the South were terrified. They were terrified that the, um, I don't know, I guess the worst fear was, you know, the sexual desires of the, the wild animal beast black man was gonna have their way with your, your wife or your sister or who else, you see? And, um, not only that, but you're fearing a kind of insurrection, an insurrection that black people are gonna rise up across the entire South. And uh, that was something that was expected also, a high level of anxiety on the part of Southerners who were still around who weren't actually fighting the war. And perhaps that is a natural thing. In any event, everybody knew that slavery was not gonna be the same, even if the South won the Civil War, you see? Even the South won the Civil War, it would have taken 10 years to drive slaves back to the level of subservience that they were after they had a position of responsibility and were accepted as, as equal kind of people as far as running the factories and the farms. You know, and that was what happened, you know. Uh, the agriculture in the South that had to supply the army of the Confederacy was largely brought in by slaves. And you would say, well, why would they do that? Aren't they fighting for the people or aren't they acting against their own interests? But see, this is part of the complicated relationship. It's very fascinating from a sociological standpoint. I mean, you know, outside of the actual, you know, atrocity of it. You see, uh, and it goes a long way to explaining people's motivations then and now. Now, like I said to you, there were a lot of um, nasty people trying to take advantage of situations, right? So let's say for instance, a, a guy who owned a farm, who owned a, a, plant, a small plantation was dead. 
and the Union Army came through um, and essentially left. And now you have this leftover farm. You see, you have this leftover farm. Nobody's really in charge of it anymore. The people who still live there, the wife, the, the daughter, the uncles, the aunts, the grandpa, they, they ran, right? Because they didn't want to be in the path of the Yankees, okay? Um, what becomes of that property? Do the Black people are still on it, right? Because they were, you know, bringing in the crops. So essentially now they're running their own, they're running their own show. You see, so white people are coming in from the north, people that we generically call carpetbaggers because they wore, they, they actually brought suitcases with them uh, that were made out of old carpet, you see, carpetbaggers, you see. And it's carpetbaggers is synonymous, of course, of people who are parasitic in nature and looking to take advantage of what later on we would call reconstruction. You see, so in this vacuum of neither slave owners nor slave families, or even in some cases in the absence of slaves, you had these people coming down as carpetbaggers, which I'm using the term generically now, which were looking just to exploit the ruins of the South. You see, you know, so this is just a great equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're from the North or whoever you are, it, it make, makes the argument that you know, evil has no label as far as where you're from. You're there to take advantage of the situation and to exploit others, period. And there's a lot of that in this story. So let me read to you the Emancipation Proclamation. It's a little bit legalese. But we'll go through it slowly. And I want to give you a sense of this. The emancipation did not free the slaves. It wasn't a document that said, everybody's free. If you're black now, everybody's free, everybody's equal. It's not. It's not what it means. Okay, it's very, very specific, right? It talks about the states, only the states that are in an open rebellion and that only meant the deep South, you see? It only meant the deep South. It did not mean the border states because the border states, even though technically they were slave states, they weren't in open rebellion, you see? Now, we remember from our earlier lectures that the Civil War I mean, what was it about? Was it about the emancipation of black people? Well, it turned out that that was a big moral aspect of it, but it's certainly not the way it started off. It started off as only a war to keep the union together, you see? So the fact that the states that were the border states were still slaveholding states or slavery was legal there wasn't a problem to the North because they weren't in rebellion. So the problem was is that the Southern states were in rebellion, not because they were slave states, you see? And you can see how the emancipation has to jump that gap, you see? It doesn't go into effect until the beginning of the next year, which was 1863, you see? And it takes a while for information to get around. And then that becomes a motivator, like I said, with the Emancipation Proclamation. And I remind you also that um, in the North, in Washington, DC, the federal government, right? The nature of the government had changed in, in Congress because the states, that used to make up a big part of the Southern Democratic constituency were gone because they had seceded from the Union, you see, which automatically gave, certainly by 1864, the Republicans a majority. Right? Look at the kind of jockeying around in Congress we have like today, right now, about how many congressmen you can get and how many senators you can get on one side or the other side of an issue. And you know, and if you have bipartisanship today, I mean, right at this moment, even considering the things that have happened only in the last couple of weeks, if you have one Republican 
join in with all of the Democrats. It's considered a big bipartisan win, you see. Imagine what it was like back here. You see, now the Southern states were, um, the Southern states were deeply democratic. And um, even the, state, the, the states that were the border states and some of the Northern states that had democratic or Democrat rather, um, um, office holders. They were not crazy about freeing black people. They just weren't. You know, the Republican party was the party that was founded on this notion that black people should be emancipated. And even their own candidate, Abraham Lincoln, was considered only a half measure to what the party espoused to be because Abraham Lincoln was like, look, if I can end this war without freeing anybody, I'll do it. You see? Okay. <clears throat> By the president of the United States of America, a proclamation. Excuse me for reading off to the side a little bit. And it's a little bit of, you think there are too many lawyers around now? Uh, sorry if you're a lawyer, I meant it with affection. This is written in the same way that you can't understand anything, okay? It's not really as bad as it could be. All right, a proclamation. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1,862, a proclamation was issued by the president of the United States, containing a mother, among other things, the following to wit. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thence forward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Now, there's a few more paragraphs, but to me, this let's stop here. And essentially what this is saying is that if you are a slave in a slave state that is in an active state of rebellion against the United States of America, This means you, right? It doesn't mean you if somebody's holding you in indentured servitude in the North. It doesn't mean that it's you if you're held as a slave in a border state. It doesn't mean that it's you if you're in one of the territories and are holding, being held as a slave. It only means the slaves in the states that are in active rebellion against the United States, the people who have officially renounced their statehood of the United States of America. And it also says that the Army and the Navy, the Union Army and the Union Navy, I mean, if, if you are an agent, the Army and the Navy, of if there are people trying to become free, it, you are an agent of responsibility for those who wish to be free, you see. All right, I'm gonna continue. That the executive will, the president, that the executive will on the first day of January, aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively, shall then be in rebellion against the United States. And the fact that any state 
or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people of thereof are not in rebellion against the United States. So it's making the distinction between here are the states that are in rebellion, here are the states that aren't in rebellion. Now, I don't know why they just didn't say that, but now therefore I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me, vested as commander in chief of the army and the Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose to do so publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned in order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, and this is in parentheses, except the parishes of St. Bernard. Uh, for, forgive me, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation of this. Placumenes, Jefferson Street, John Street, Charles Street, James, Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, La Forche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, the states of Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, parentheses, except for the 48 counties designated as West Virginia. By the way, did you know that West Virginia became West Virginia right now? Because West Virginia was part of Virginia, and these counties that seceded from Virginia because they didn't want to be part of the seceding from the United States of America. That's how West Virginia was formed. And that's what it's referring to here. Virginia, except for the states which were to become West Virginia. I mean, the counties that were to become West Virginia. Except for the 48 counties designated as West Virginia. And also the counties of Berkeley, Acomac, Northampton, Elizabeth City, New York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. So if you're part of those exemptions, this doesn't apply to you. It only applies to the states and areas that are in active rebellion, the Emancipation Proclamation. And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward, henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons, right? I'll read, I'm gonna read that last sentence again. Will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. So if you're a slave from one of these states in rebellion and you wind up in the proximity or the possession or the hands of the United States Army or the Navy, it is the Army or the Navy's responsibility to make sure that you're safe. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, 
unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. Now, this is something new. This is something new. This is Abraham Lincoln. Now, a, pretty, a lot of people in Congress, especially the Democrats, hated his guts for this because they didn't want people of color, as we would say today, to be members of the armed services of the United States of America. And here Lincoln is essentially by executive wartime authority saying, we're taking black people into the service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the constitution, upon military necessity, you see that's it, upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of almighty God. See, he's borrowing Jeffersonian language here. If you wanna refer that back to the um, Declaration of Independence. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863. And of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th the 87th, by the President Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State, who couldn't stand Lincoln, by the way, sidebar. Um, so there it is, the Emancipation Proclamation. So this is the big belly flop in the pool now. This is a game changer, uh, doesn't go into effect until the next year. And there were still people dragging their butts about it because, you know, can you imagine if this was today, and let's say, for instance, like one of our politicians did it. I mean, you know, you'd have this 24-7 news cycle and whoever the opponents of said politician was who did this would be saying, he doesn't have the authority to do that. He's just trying to kill his, you know, uh, political enemies and all the rest of that. It's got nothing to do with the Constitution. And, and you'd have people who would love it and you'd have people who hate it. And all of the press would get behind you or against you. Uh, some things in our country haven't changed. It's only the speed of them has changed. You see, I remind you that when Harry Truman uh, integrated the military after World War II, I think I think it was what, 1947, 48, uh, he didn't do that through Congress. He did that by executive action and people hated him for it. I mean, it was one thing having World War II and ha okay, so we had to have women behind machines and we had to have black people who were building submarines and stuff, you know. But now you're and, and but now you're making people uh, officers in the military. I'm going to have to supply. I'm going to have to salute a black colonel. I'm going to have to salute a woman. And it was one thing when we had to do it, but please. All right. So there's the Emancipation Proclamation. So once this filters down into the South, right? January 1863. Now, obviously, you know, people aren't pulling out their, their cell phones and they're getting Twitter messages and Snapchats and things like that. But, you know, I mean, news does travel, you see, and this is a game changer. This is a game changer. Now, as far as one nation using the indentured servants or the slaves or the oppressed of its opponent, right, as it seemed like the United States was doing here to undermine the South, it's done all the time. It's done all the time. During the American Revolution, 
that was done by the British to the Indians against the, against the rebellion, uh, rebellious colonists, right? The Indians were promised all sorts of things by the British. And the French of in and Indian War is probably the best single example. And, um, you know, so this is a pretty common thing. Now, as far as the war expediency is concerned, there were two aspects of this, right? We needed the manpower. We wanted to give blacks in the South an incentive to get up and go and come to us, at least politically. Uh, we wanted to give Southern people who were still holding on to slavery as a lifestyle to give them a blow to their morale, giving them an idea of where this was all going. You know, you can imagine the kind of uh, psychological, sociological, political problem this created when you just incentivized everybody who you're trying to keep down to give them their freedom. I mean, if the black people down in the South, which they were, were creating all the crops and creating all the machines and all the rest of that, well, maybe they'll just work a little more slowly today. Maybe the machine broke. And maybe the South will lose and we'll all be free. This is a big problem for the South. Now, there was this also this thing called the Confiscation Act, which the North had. And confiscation uh, meant that in wartime, let's say, for instance, the Union Army was to come down and they were able to chase away a bunch of, um, I don't know, Confederate, a whole Confederate camp, or there was a battle. And everything that was left over after the battle, all the Confederate cannons, and the ammunition, well, it's yours now, right? You confiscate it for the war, or you run across like Sherman did in the March to the Sea, which we're gonna talk about on January 12th, you come across the farm. So now you eat uh, and drink the bounty of, of, of livestock and, and the harvest of the farm, right? You've confiscated it and it's, you're, able to, you're able to confiscate it because it's a war. You see now, remember that in confiscation and the terms I'm talking about, what if you just confiscate black people that are on a farm in the South? Let's say for instance, they didn't want to be emancipated or they don't know what emancipation needs. You as the army can still take them because they're considered property. It's the Southern, Southern owner's property and you need them for the war effort. So just like you were gonna take their ammunition or their cow or drink their milk, or eat their food, you're taking these people because they're property. And that's the confiscation act. You see, you know, we think about terms, uh, things in terms of, um, from our perspective, right? Like, why didn't people run? You know, why did people hold slaves? Didn't they know it was immoral? You see, but to put ourselves in the place and at the time, you know, we need to understand that people, I mean, if you grew up, if you and I were black and we grew up in this slavery, okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make it seem like it isn't what it was by using the term indentured servitude. And, you know, even if we weren't getting beaten every day or, you know, your sister getting raped or something, and you know, we, I don't know, would you and I know what freedom meant? We know what it is to live like this, but you have to have things to compare it to. You know, see, you and I have things to compare things to so we can make certain distinctions. But if you and I grew up in a certain situation where this is the way it was, and this is the way it seemingly always was, you know, based on <clears throat> some stories that people are telling you, what are you really what are you really comparing it to? What are you really comparing it to? Freedom is a is something that I just I'm putting a caveat here into saying that you and I have an understanding of freedom 
and this notion of a birthright of what is what you are entitled to that is something to be cherished that other people who never had it it's hard to even comprehend it and that's true even for civilizations around the world today vis-a-vis -vis us What about this? What about the North? What about the North? What were Blacks like in the North during this entire time? And if you were in, uh, drawn into the army, like the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, you didn't have to be just drawn in from the army from the North, from the South. I mean, what if you were a Black person who lived in the North? You see, now actually by, by the end of the war, right, by after the Emancipation Proclamation, et cetera, we had a sizable number of black troops in the United States Army, and they certainly were in all kinds of supportive roles, et cetera, in the Navy. Um, and this was in a um, uh, segregated way, of course, right? So you have white officers, generally speaking, and you have these black contingents of troops or, or people who are in the Navy, for instance, and all kinds of logistic things, uh, stevedores, people loading stuff on railroads, uh, mechanics, laborers, everything else like that. You know, generally speaking, it's going to be some kind of a secondary stuff. You know, but not necessarily. There are several stories in the American army, uh, or at least the Union army. I got to be careful with that because technically both sides were American, right? The South and the North. And um, there was, uh, maybe you've seen the movie Glory, which was one example of when Blacks actually had, were in combat at, uh, on behalf of the Union. And this is a big game changer. This is a big, big game changer as far as the perceptions that black people had of themselves. I mean, as far as emancipation is concerned, or even if you were a Northern black who wasn't exactly considered equal and you were fighting alongside other white people with the same rifle that they were using, the same ammunition that they were using, and the same ability to inflict deadly force as they were, there's no way that anybody's coming out of this the same as you went into it. You see, if there is a black person to the left of you and to the right of you, and they have just saved your life, or you're finding out that they're a better shot than you are, or that they're more brave than you are, it is a game changer. And if anything is going to melt certain prejudices, no matter how you were raised, situations like this would be it. This is like a parallel to what I was describing to the phenomenon in the South, where Black people left to be in charge of a farm that are actually being benevolent to the white people who were left because the white people who used to be in a position of oppression of them are gone or dead. And there's no way that the white people left on that farm who are now being cared for and fed by the black people who are in power because of the absence of everyone else. There's no way that those white people is not gonna have an impression on them. You see, everything changed here. In World War II, the things would never be the same as far as perceptions of women or, um, or even African-Americans, not to say that there wasn't racism, still heavy duty. You know, it's kind of like you're, you're a Tuskegee Airman and, you're come, and you, were, you shot down three Nazi airplanes, you know, which you would think would be something everyone would agree would be a game changer. Yet at the same time, you get off the ship back in the United States and they're still calling you the N-word and all the rest of this, you see? But in a societal impact, it can never be the same as it was before, you see. And you have these desperate people who are trying to drive things back the way they used to be. 
but it can never be the same way it was back before. We had the, um, um, the civil rights, real civil rights movements and legislations in the 1960s. In fact, Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech was on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation by design. I say that if it wasn't for World War II, the rights of women, women's liberation, whatever you want to call it, emancipation, um, real social justice in the original terms of the original civil rights movement, that is, that was accelerated heavily by World War II. And um, ditto that for the Civil War. Um, ditto that for the Civil War, as clunky as it was. Now, Reconstruction is something that should require a, a six-part series. You see, uh, we spent the rest of the century, the 19th century, in something called Reconstruction. You know, we think that the Civil War, okay, well, that was over. Let's move on to the next thing. It wasn't over. It wasn't over in 1865. This wasn't over what we're talking about today, effectively, till the beginning of World War I. See, as far as putting the country back together. And it's the issue of Black people in context to that is more complicated still. It's more complicated still. And um, so let's say, for instance, you were in the South. And let's say that an army was coming through, let's say it was General Sherman, right? So you're around Atlanta and um, General Sherman's army is coming through. Now, General Sherman had no love of Negroes, right? It wasn't just that he couldn't care less. He had no, I mean, Emancipating black people wasn't his game. That's not why he was there. He was a military officer. He didn't have any time for the politics and today what we would call for this, the social justice ramifications and moral obligations. And you see, it was easier, I suppose, uh, up to a certain point to be a military officer with military responsibilities. You see, yet the Emancipation Proclamation put him by decree responsible for what the Emancipation Proclamation said. So that means that if a bunch of Black people showed up at his campsite, then he had to take care of them, whether he wanted to or not. And this presented a tremendous problem for advancing American armies, whether it was General Sherman or somebody else, you see. It was just that General Sherman in the West and in the South encountered more because he was in the Deep South, whereas the Army of the Potomac was further north. Now, you had these hundreds and thousands of Black people who heard all about the Emancipation Proclamation, and they were flocking to the Union Army. And maybe you didn't even make it to the Union Army. Maybe on the way to the Union Army, you ran into the Confederate Army. See? And then you just got shot. Or held prisoner. But probably shot. Because why waste food on you? You see? And... Um, but let's say, for instance, you made it to Sherman's army. They had these camps that literally were attached now to Sherman's army and other Union armies, where you had these essentially what we would refer to today as refugees following the army. Now, Sherman, in his particular case, and we'll talk about more of this when we talk about from Atlanta to Appomattox in session uh, six, he, the only reason why Sherman was successful with what he was doing was because he was able to break away from the Norman, normal logistical supply train that was 
the railroad system, et cetera. Because the further you got into enemy territory, and down in Atlanta was deep in enemy territory for a Union army, you could be flanked around the side and you could have your supply lines cut off. So if Sherman was responsible for um, advancing, he was also responsible for taking his scarce amount of troops and constantly pulling them away from the advance action of his army to cover his rear guard defense of everything he's already captured. And you have to, because that is your logistical supply train, which your enemy knows, and he's trying to cut you off and isolate you in the middle of the South. You see, so what Sherman did was he made himself, to give himself maneuverability, he decided to, that he and his, land, and his army were gonna live off the land. And that means that we are going to take whatever we have to take to survive and eat from the Southerners. Now, having a thousand refugee slaves attached to your army means that you have to feed all of them now. This became a big logistical problem for the Union armies. But military command is subservient to the executive. And that's just the way it is, right? So if you're a real military commander and you know the vertical command hierarchy and any general who thinks that he's smarter than the president usually runs into some trouble sooner or later, okay? And there are several examples of this. And um, so, Black people were following the American armies, the rather the Union armies all over the place. Now Sherman, in the last year of the war, actually made a field decision and gave the Black people who were following him, that were attached to him, 40 acres near the Carolina coast, each one. And he, that was a temporary decree that he gave and Congress had to sort it out after the war. And most of those people actually wound up with that land. Another little interesting caveat there. Because he of course was, he Sherman was moving towards the Carolinas and to the coast, hence the march to the sea, right? Now, I don't know if you know this, but even the Confederate army became so desperate to replace their manpower that they had all kinds of discussions about whether or not they should accept blacks into uniform. Confederate black soldiers. Now, does that seem like an oxymoron to you? Why would a black person fight for a cause that essentially stood for their own repression, right? And I wanna remind you of something. We have to be careful of the bias that we have of looking in the past from things that seem so obvious to us today. I told you the psychology about the, uh, I use the phrase Stockholm syndrome, et cetera. And uh, it's, there were many black people, maybe they bought into the notion that the South was a more benevolent place. Um, I can't really explain it, okay? Or maybe that if they served, then they would get special favor or that uh, once this was over, it was clear that slavery was unsustainable. I don't know, I don't know. But it was very, very difficult, obviously, for the Southern army and the Southern politicians, right? They had a problem here. They had in psychology, it's called cognitive dissonance, right? You can't have two thoughts that are so disparate actually occupy the same place without a conflict. You say one's gotta go or the other's gotta go. And um, 
The problem was, I mean, fundamentally, for any Southerner, was that if you make the argument that a black person could be a good soldier, you can no longer sustain the argument that a person should be enslaved because they're not really a real person, you see? They can't occupy, those two things can't occupy the same space, right? If you're saying that black people need to be taken care of and that's why they need a, a benevolent paternalistic figure to take care of them because they're incapable of caring for themselves, how is it possible now that I'm gonna train a black soldier to be a good black soldier? And if they're a good black soldier, that automatically just negates the entire rationalization of slavery. See, that's the damn problem. But at the end, they became absolutely desperate. And yes, by the beginning of 1865, Confederate States of America Army had former slaves and white troops marching together in the streets of Richmond. Of course, the war was to be over right then. But that's quite a turn of events. That's quite, I mean, what it would have portrayed for the future, I, I really don't know. The war was essentially over by Appomattox. But if you're fighting for your freedom, Right, even if you were a black soldier, I mean, you obviously were fighting for something and you've been giving the ultimate force. You've been giving a weapon that will achieve deadly force. It's an ultimate thing, you see? How can you go back to who you were before? How can you? How can you fight for the Confederate cause as a black person and be accepted by the white people and then what, after the war, let's say the, the Confederacy won. And you're gonna put down your rifle and you're gonna go back out to the field and have nothing after that? Right now, none of that issue came to pass, but that would have been a hard nut to crack, you see? Now in the North, either you were a former slave who had actually wound up being attached to one of these Union armies, and then you were emancipated and brought into the Union army, or you were from the North and were in the Union army as a black soldier, despite the fact that you were completely segregated, you still had, were using deadly force, you were still a soldier, you were still fighting for the same thing everybody else was fighting for. What greater inspiration could you have for being able to fight for your own freedom than that, than being in combat, to being in combat, you see? And that's kind of a parallel, I used the term earlier, you know, even by World War II, I mean, you had people who were, I mean, and you know, blacks were in a lot of subservient roles, right? If you were on a Navy ship, you were a steward, you were, uh, I don't know, the mess hand, you were, you were working in the, the galley, this sort of a thing. You were in these subservient roles, you see? Yeah. What if you were a Tuskegee Airman? Maybe you shot down the three Nazi pilots, you see? A lot of things that are to be reconciled, how people did it internally, and in context of society, this is the study of this type of sociology. It's beyond the scope of some of what we're doing today. But you know, because of who I am and my training, I tend to focus on it and linger on it because I think this is really at the meat and potatoes of it. You know, um, so let me read to you something else now that comes up during the Civil War. Okay, there are three amendments that are called the Civil Rights Amendments, and the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. 
of the Constitution, effectively ending slavery and creating equality for all American citizens. By the way, who are we excluding? Women. Not black women, women, right? Black people here have the right to vote in these three amendments. Women have to wait for the right to vote till 1920. Just saying, just saying. So here's the 13th amendment to the constitution. Uh, this is passed by Congress. Remember, um, amendments to the constitution have to be ratified by the states. Oh, incidentally, as a condition <clears throat> of being admitted or readmitted back into the union after the Civil War was over for the states that had denounced their, their part of the union, their being part of the union, as a condition of getting back into the union, you had to ratify the 13th Amendment. No ratification of the 13th Amendment, you were not letting you back into the union. Passed by Congress January 31st, 1865. So you see this actually occurred before Appomattox. So right, right around the time that black people were marching with white troops in Richmond in the Confederate army, this now becomes law. And it's not ratified though. You're right, it's, it's ratified later in the year by December 6th, 1865, because it takes, you know, because certain states were dragging their heels, right? For the reasons I mentioned before, you know, not everybody's too crazy about this. It's one thing keeping the union together. It's a one thing, it's another thing, black people not being enslaved, but my equal, I don't know if I'm ready to swallow that yet. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> it's actually pretty short. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. That's it. That's the 13th Amendment. I'm going to read it again. Neither slavery or involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So during the Civil War, Washington DC puts this into action to amend the Constitution of the United States officially making slavery illegal anywhere in the jurisdiction of the United States before the end of the Civil War. And what a legacy. Of course, there were other things. You needed the 14th and 15th Amendment because after that, everyone's saying, well, you know, there's this reason why you shouldn't be equal to me. And there's that reason why you shouldn't be equal to me. And don't tell me that just because we're not allowed to keep you as a slave that you can vote. You see, you know, and those are the reasons for the 14th and 15th Amendment, uh, which you hear a lot about as the basis for many of the things that are in current events today, whether they have to do with particularly slavery or other issues, you see. All right, we've got uh, 10 minutes left, essentially. Um, let me see if I, we've got any comments or questions, and um, this would be a good time to stop. Yeah, nothing in the chat so far, but if anybody wants to put something into the chat, 
um, I can read it out loud for you, or you can feel free at this point, I'm gonna actually unpin our picture and then you guys can feel free to raise your hand or just um, get our attention and you can start speaking using your microphone too. Well, if there aren't any questions, what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna give you a preview of the 14th and the 15th amendment because it would be a good hinge point right here. And um, we can go on to it after reconstruction or during reconstruction, but these three amendments go together. They go together one right after the other. Uh, one was passed during the, uh, during the Civil War, as I said, the 13th Amendment. And it's a shame that Lincoln was assassinated, right? Uh, and because it was his doing. And then you've got the 14th Amendment, which became necessary for loopholes during Reconstruction that people were trying to figure out a way around the fact that slavery was legal now, see? You know, I'll tell you, if you if, if, try to put yourself in this position, I'm not advocating that you're in this position, but to understand somebody as a counselor, you know, literally I'm in a position where it's my job to understand people that like nobody wants to understand, right? People who are mentally ill, people who have done some nasty stuff. It's not my job there to be an activist against them. I'm the counselor, I'm the psychotherapist. It's my job, and for whatever reason, God gave me the ability to do this, all right? To be able to understand the motivations of that person. It's not the same thing as accepting their behavior, but you're not gonna do anything about their behavior unless you understand their behavior, unless you're talking about somebody who is just 100% psychopath, you know? And, you know, I understand in those conditions then they, some people need to be locked up, okay? I know that sounds a little cruel, but. Um, so let's go to the 14th Amendment. Now, this is, a lot of this was done, um, there's a lot of books these days about uh, General or President Grant, by the way, who was actually a very big advocate to all of this business of reconstruction and putting the union back together and freedom. And if we do a program on General Grant or President Grant, I can tell you all about that. There's a lot of very Ron Chair now, a lot of different excellent books that are written about Grant. Um, so this was um, passed by Congress June 13th, 1866, ratified 1868, right? Okay, section one, this is the 14th amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. This strictly came up, this business of citizenship, okay? Because people were saying after the 13th Amendment, like I was, I alluded to you before, it's kind of like, let's say, for instance, I grew up from, from cradle to adulthood as an avowed uh, racist, right? Because that's just the way I was raised, right? I mean, you know, it's just normal. Black people's not, they're not my equals. They're, they're there to be servants to me. I, as a white person, am superior to them. I mean, if you and I were living in a situation like that, you and I would be the exact same way, okay? But anyway, the reason is now for this is that, okay, so the Civil War's over. The Black person who used to be my slave is now, according to the law, I am not able to be my slave anymore, you see? But don't tell me you're my equal. You see, and the rationalization I'm going to come up with and local politicians came up with is that this really doesn't apply to you, you American Negro, because the Constitution only applies to citizens. You see, so the 13th Amendment said that you can't be a slave, that's fine, but don't tell me you have the rights as an American because you don't, because you're not a citizen, because you were 
countryless as a slave. You were a non-entity. You weren't even a human being. You weren't even represented in the Constitution as a full person, yet three-fifths of a person. You see, so laws don't apply to you, even though you can't be a slave anymore, so says the 13th Amendment, you don't have habeas corpus because you're not a citizen. See, that was the rationalization that people were making. That's why the 14th Amendment, if you enter this earth in the United States of America, boom, you're a citizen period. That's what, that's why this was necessary. That's why this was necessary. You see, so it doesn't matter if you were a slave, if you were born in the shed at the back of the plantation in Mississippi or anywhere, you're an American, period. You see, now, a lot of times you hear the 14th Amendment and different sorts of uh, arguments about, you know, um, migration, right? So, you know, uh, anchor babies, this sort of a thing. And maybe it's an abuse of, you know, the 14th Amendment for people to come here in their ninth month of pregnancy and, oh, look at that. I happen to have my baby here and, you know, wherever on the United States soil. And now, my child is an American citizen. So, you know, was that by accident? Did I exploit the system? It doesn't matter. According to the 14th Amendment, if you're born on United States soil, you're an American citizen. And that's it, period. And that's where, that's the origin of this. And, um, as far as the 15th Amendment is concerned, this has to do with, of course, um, rights, right? The rights of citizens of the United States to vote, right? So this is suffrage for, it's referring to essentially black people here, right? Because like I told you before, the people they're referring to here, as far as you're being able to vote is fine, unless you're a woman, you see? The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Or previous condition of servitude. See, so that's why these three amendments go together. You can see that it took, it took the first one, the 13th, which, you know, at a casual glance, well, this ought to do, it will make slavery illegal. Well, it wasn't enough because then everybody tried to find their perceived real or imagined loopholes on it. And then you had to have the 14th for reasons I already described. And then other people were like, well, you know, maybe you have rights, but don't tell me you're voting, you know? And this of course now from the part of the constitution of the United States, you have the right to vote. The rights of citizens of the United States to vote, right? The 14th amendment made you a citizen, you see? if you were born here, period, right? The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And those three were it. And that was the three that did it. But when it came to women's being able to vote, that had to, re that had to wait until 1920, into the 19th Amendment. That said, it was illegal to uh, it was illegal to say that you couldn't vote, you know, based on race or sex, sex essentially, gender. You see, now the way the language in these things is messed up today, uh, or manipulated today, is the wording of a lot of modern legislation. You can read it yourself, uh, which isn't really talking about citizens; it's talking about people residing in the United States. You see which is a carve out to go around people who aren't citizens, you see? So, so if you're just gonna say that citizens have this right, that may be one thing, but much of the wording today is that residents of the United States, which means that you don't have to be a citizen 
or you don't have to be naturalized and you'll still have those rights or you'll still be entitled to those benefits. You see, so the wording is very important in these things. Back in these three, they're actually using the terms, at least in the 14th and 15th, the specific word citizen. And it was understood back then uh, that if you were a citizen, then you were entitled to the rights of a citizen. And those languages are being changed um, uh, in real fashion. Anyway, uh, so I hope that gave you a flavor of some of the things that were going on as far as Blacks in the Civil War, uh, during the Civil War. As I said before, I could have done this for hours. And, um, but I try not to open up a bigger can of worms than I'm able to handle in an hour and a half. So. <laughs> I'm glad to have seen you. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 29th. And as always, if you have questions or comments that you think of, you know, in the middle of the night or after we've signed off, feel free to shoot me an email by just replying to that Zoom invitation. And I will get all of those questions over to Arthur and he will either address them at the next program or he'll just reply to your email. So absolutely let me know if there's something that's you would like cleared up for the next session. I sincerely wish everybody a very, very, very Merry Christmas if you celebrate it. I will see everybody just a few days before 2021 ends. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.